Let's take a few moments to just welcome the Spirit of God to be here. Would you say this with me? Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, move in my heart. Move in my mind. Move in my life. Touch me deep inside. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Father, right now as we get to your word, Lord, we bless your word and may it go forth and do what it's intended for. Pierce in heart and bone and marrow, enable us to be convicted by truth. Lord, we need your truth. Clean us, cleanse us, touch us, oh God. Father, speak to our hearts and change our lives. In Jesus' name and all of us say, Amen. Isn't God good? Amen. Let's give the Lord praise in this place. Amen. Praise God. We just started a very difficult series and last week we started speaking about hell. I need to make a few disclaimers. We're really living in an age that anyone that speaks on hell obviously uh, might be seen in a negative light. And the reason is simple. Uh, humanity rejects eternal destruction. Humanity hates the idea that there's a place where the everlasting wrath of God uh, remains. Um, most people don't want to think about it because it just, it doesn't feel good, right? Like when we wake up in a day, we honestly want to think of good things, you know? We might look at the mirror and we want to tell ourselves, you know, today's going to be a great day. And we try our best to make our day good, right? As, as best as we can. And then all of a sudden you hear the topic on hell. It's not something we really want. I understand that. But as people of God, we need to hear about hell once in a while, not every week, praise God, right? Otherwise, we have to change the church to hell church, you know, but we are not. Just this month, you need to join in in the conversation and hear this topic because not only is it biblically true, but Jesus gave the biggest, greatest warnings on hell. In fact, he spoke more on hell than on heaven because he's warning people about the place called hell. And so today we're going to do part two. And I, I, need, I need your help, really. Uh, I need you to get this word out. It's not just to get people to the church, but it's more importantly to get people to Christ, to get people to Jesus quick. I think last week, I'm so uh, glad uh, quite a few of you emailed me and texted me to say uh, it was a wake-up call. And some of you actually showed me that you are sending out to your friends, really sent out uh, the message last week, sent it out this week, later on in the day, once it's uh, you know, captured in the Lighthouse YouTube channel, send it out, send out the link, send it out. Uh, you, you might say, Pastor, I don't know whether my friend will react in a negative or positive way. Uh, I think good news is that you're not the one preaching. So <laughs> if they react negatively, they might hate me, not you, okay? <laughs> right? If you are shy, you say, you know, hey, brother, you know, I don't know whether this, why don't you just watch this? My church just preached on this and see what they, they say. Hopefully, uh, it leads to something. It leads to some level of conviction. Today, we're going to talk about what hell is like. So we have to go in deeper into the arena called hell. We need to understand what the Bible actually tells us about hell. And there are many descriptives. I'm going to give you quite a number. Let's get with number one. Write this down. Or don't write it down. It's up to you. Eternal destruction. Hell is known as eternal destruction. Second Thessalonians uh, 1, 9. Let's look at the screen, please. Uh, can we have the next slide? So hell is eternal destruction. And then the next slide, Second Thessalonians 1, 9, it says, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Now, I, I need to talk about this for a moment. I want you to really pay attention because it's, it's, in, it's important you understand this. Do you know that on this earth, even if you're a non-believer, even if your brothers or sisters uh, and, and friends are non-believers, they still encounter the presence of God to some degree. You say, what, what do you mean? 
uh, it's not a saving presence of God that leads them to salvation as yet, but it's a presence of God as in when they enjoy their day, right? They look at the beautiful sun. It's the presence of God. It's the presence of God that causes the sun to shine. It's the power of God that gives them food to eat and, and water to drink and, and pools to swim in and sceneries to enjoy and, and work to, to be proud of, family to really be blessed by, kids as your reward and poster. Even as an unbeliever, you get to enjoy the presence of God. Hell has none of those things. Hell has no friendship. Hell is not sex, drugs, and rock and roll as much as try, people try to hope that it is. Would you want to go to heaven or hell? And someone might say, I want to go to hell so I can party in hell. There's no party in hell. Hell is eternal destruction. Pastor Pace said, did you say it? I didn't say it. The Bible says it. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. To be destroyed again and again and again and again. In this life, we can die once. In the next life, you die forever. You keep dying again and again, and it's not like dying and resurrection. No, because you're a spirit, and so your spirit can take death, but the difference is you are still in pain. A person is in hell is being destroyed again and again and again, and notice the words, away from the presence of the Lord. There's nothing good about it. No mercy, no grace, no love, no enjoyment, no pleasure, nothing good. Is in hell. Nothing. You say, but I, I, my friends in hell, but they're not there to enjoy hell with you. They are there to suffer alongside with you if you should be going there. Hell is a place of eternal destruction. And the might of God is not there to save. You know, we sing the song, He's mighty to save. Hell is not a place of salvation. Hell is a place where the might of God is not seen. It's only the wrath, the fierce anger, the judgment of God is burning forth in hell forevermore. Now you say, Pastor, that freaks me out. I don't want to hear this on a Sunday morning. I also prefer not to hear this on a Sunday morning. I, I, I don't. But I, I, I got to do this because it's a warning. And perhaps through all this, it might stir us to say, I have not much time left on this earth. I want to make sure I'm right with God. And I bring as many people as I can with me. I want to share with them, hey, avoid hell. You can go to heaven. You can know this person called Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Do you know what he did? And then you go into the beautiful gospel message that saves. But, you know, you and I have got to partake the gospel message ourselves. We've got to say, this is really wonderful news. Jesus is the one that saves. Write this down, the next one. It's a place of torment. Not only is hell a place of eternal destruction, it's a place of torment. People are being tormented. Now you say, what's the difference? There's a slight difference. Torment is, you know, sometimes emotional torment, you know what I'm saying? Some of you are not suffering physically, but you're tormented by guilt or shame or torment of the past hurts, torment of what someone did evil to you, and there's torment. So it's not just physical pain. Torment is, 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 is a kind of emotional, physiological, psychological, uh, deep soulish pain. The Bible says in Luke 16, 23, and in Hades being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. Some months ago, I actually spoke on Luke 16. So I'm not going to rehash it here, but in the story, you have two people that died. A very rich man and Lazarus the beggar. Both died. In life, Lazarus was the loser. The rich man was the winner. In death, in the next life, it was the reverse. The rich man was in hell or Hades and the beggar was beside Abraham's bosom, was in heaven. That was a reverse. And here, it's one, just one verse, it explains this rich man was in torment. He's being tormented. Now, the whole story is, is an amazing story. It's very painful. Jesus gave the story, by the way, right? He gave the story, and the rich man was in agony, and in fact, he was begging, right? He was begging Abraham, can you send Lazarus, the beggar, to just dip one drop of water on his finger, 
and put it on my tongue to cool me down for a while. Just, just, uh, just a short moment. And Abraham said, no, it can't happen. There's a chasm between heaven and Hades, which means what? It's a separation. You know, Christians, we've heard this, right? Uh, as a sinner, we are separated from God. But now that we are Christians, we are linked and unified in the Holy Spirit to Christ. This rich man was separated from God for all eternity. While he was on earth, there was still a chance for him to turn his soul, his life, his heart towards Jesus. And he missed that chance. He was so embroiled with the things of this world, the affairs of this world, the delights that this world could offer. And he missed out eternal bliss with Abraham and the other saints, with God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He missed that chance and he was in hell. Remember the last request he made to Abraham? Okay, since I can't have any water, can you please send Lazarus to tell my brothers who are still living on earth? Tell them and warn them about this place. And you know what Abraham said? They're not going to believe. Even if someone were to rise up from the dead, they're not going to believe just like that. You say, Pastor, how is it possible that people will not believe if someone is resurrected? The truth is, there are millions and millions of people that believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but do not believe on him for eternal life. Jesus came back from death to life. You believe it, I believe it, but many don't believe that. And even if they did, it does not mean they are going to willingly give their heart and mind and soul to Jesus. So Abraham was right. You know, if you are shocked, you say, Pastor, I thought it's possible someone that's resurrected is going to bring many people to Christ. May not be. Abraham said so. Abraham said, no, even if someone to rise up from death to life might not believe, they might not believe. It's a place of torment. The next thing, write this down. It's a place of outer darkness. You say, what is that? See, darkness is bad enough. Like for us um, in Singapore, you never get a place of full pitch black darkness. Not so easy. You're somewhere along the line, maybe kilometers away, miles away, you still have some light source somewhere. But this is about a darkness that is so thick that you cannot see anything even before your hands. It's, it's a darkness that is so embroiled with, with death and, and sin and foulness. Look at what the Bible says, Matthew twenty-two thirteen. Then the king said to the attendants, this is the king, Jesus, said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See the picture given that Jesus is going to be casting on judgment day millions upon millions upon millions of souls into outer darkness, into hell. The word here, weeping and gnashing of teeth, we're going to look at it in a few moments' time because that's one of the descriptions of hell that comes out several times, weeping and gnashing of teeth, outer darkness. You say, Pastor, why is outer darkness so frightening? Well, we all do not appreciate light until we stumble and fall. We, we don't appreciate light until we realize that I could literally injure myself as I'm making my way uh, in the dark to my bathroom at night without any light source. Right? We don't appreciate how good light is to our sight, to our senses, to our well-being. In hell, friend, it's complete outer darkness. You are away from light source. You are away from illumination. You are away from sight. Why? Because the persons that go to hell are blind eternally, blind spiritually. And where they are, it is a fitting description of what they were on earth. You know, as Christians, we, we say, I was once blind. But now I see. See what? See the love of God. See the mercy of Christ. See the cross of Jesus. It's supposed to be seeing the right thing. We are not blind to our sin to only see more sin. We are blind in the past in our sin now to only see the grace and the mercy of Jesus. Lord, let your blood cover over me and my household. Is that your prayer? Lord, you said you're the light of the world. If we follow you, your word says, you will give us the light of life. And you said, I will never walk in darkness. Why should you follow Jesus? He's the light of the world. If you follow him, you will have the light of life. The words he used, exact words. The light 
of life, eternal life, the light of life, and you will never walk in darkness. Promised by Jesus, not Pastor Pacer. He promised it. If we follow Jesus, you have the light of life. You say, Pastor, it's hell for me. It used to be. We all deserve hell. That's what our sins deserve. And Jesus paid for our sins. If we follow Christ, we have the light of life. Hell is no longer our destination when we die, friends. But then again, it does not mean that we should not feel a sense of dread towards hell and its occupants, towards friends and family that we know that might be headed there or have even gone there. Some of our friends and family, hope this doesn't offend, are there. Some of the people you and I loved are there. Some of the people you love and I love that are still alive here on this earth are headed there. Unless they receive the light of life, they receive the light of the world. Jesus. I hope this helps because we know it, so we got to do something about it. Something must activate our passion to share Christ. Sharing Christ should no longer be optional for the Christian. And I know we do it at times, and we are all guilty, and we feel bad. But friends, I've shared many times, guilt will not change our lives. Conviction changes lives. Father, convict us. Oh gosh. Lord, our friends are headed there. Our families are headed there. Those that do not know Christ, our colleagues that are not in Jesus are headed there. It's true. Friends, this is what Satan comes to us and says. And we know it's a lie, but we try to entertain it. But perhaps, perhaps, just on their deathbed, they receive Jesus. And so it pushes us to say, let's be lukewarm and not share. Perhaps, God is so merciful that I, I know Jesus is the only way, but perhaps God has prepared another way besides Jesus. And so somehow, my friends and family will still go to heaven, even though they are not believers on Jesus. It's a nice sentiment, but it's not true. You see, because for us to say that, we are calling Jesus a liar. Jesus says, I'm the only way, the only truth, and the only life. No one goes to heaven or no one goes to the Father except through me. Friends, you've got to hear this. No other religion will say, if you need to believe that at the very depths of your soul, no other religion will say, if no other founder of religion can save. There's no other means and methods to bring one to heaven except through Jesus Christ. It's so offensive to an unbelieving world. And you know what's the worst part? Sometimes it's also offensive to Christians. Because easily we can think of people we know that are no longer here on earth that did not believe in Jesus, but seem to live a good moral life. But the way they went was not Christ. And friend, I, I don't want to tell you what's good. Finally, we will say things like this to assuage our, our situation. We'll say, God is the final judge. He is. God is the final judge. He is. But God has really proclaimed how he's going to judge. He has proclaimed the way of salvation, singular. Jesus, my son, singular. He has proclaimed that only way. And so you and I cannot say, okay, I hope my friend, deathbed, they will say the sinner's prayer. Deathbed, they'll place their faith in Jesus. I will visit them on their deathbed. Maybe then, pastor, they'll be willing to hear. No. While on earth, while they're still breath, while they're still alive, while they're still working, while they're still in retirement, while they're still alive, we share the gospel with them now so that they can do something about it. Because I'm going to tell you something. Some people take a long time to come to Christ. We cannot just imagine the last hour of their life. Would you believe on Jesus, please? They will believe. Worst thing, what if you don't even have the chance to see them on their deathbed? Remember what happened in COVID? Some families could not see their loved ones when they died from COVID. Do you remember that? You can't even see them. You can't even have the deathbed wish to share Christ. But now there's time, friends. Now there's still time. Next one. Four, lake of fire. Hell is described as a lake of fire. 
The Bible says, Revelations 20, 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, look at the words, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You say, Pastor, why is a person thrown into a lake of fire? No one is going to willingly go to hell. Friends, I'm going to tell you something, Christian or non-Christian, no one would willingly go to hell if they knew what hell was. The problem is many people don't believe there's a hell, or if they believe there's a hell, they think it's sex, drugs, and rock and roll, or if they believe it's a hell, they would think it's for Hitler and, and, and all the very wicked people. They don't believe that hell is for the sinner. They don't believe that hell is for the unbeliever. They don't believe that hell is for someone that is not in Christ. They don't believe that. And so many people are sliding into hell. They do not know that. They live their best life here on earth, did not prepare for the next life, which is the eternal life, and are sliding into hell and are thrown. No one goes to hell willingly. You have to be thrown to hell. And God is the one that does the throwing. Now, the picture of throwing away is important because it's a picture of refuge. In the Old Testament, this whole idea of refuge or waste Gehenna, thrown into a place of refuge, a waste, eternal waste. Hell is a place where worthless people, worthless souls are thrown there because they did not come to faith in Christ. And these are not my words, friends. I, I've read the Bible enough to say, wow, it, the foolish and the wise, those that are wise, they will build their house on Christ. Those that are foolish, they will build their house on anything else. That's why we have to tell people, let's build our house and our lives on the right thing. Isn't it amazing that many people are trying to build their lives on health tips, on diet tips, on investment tips, on gym tips, but they're not prepared for the next life. It's really happening, folks, all around us. Just a cursory glance, you say, Pastor, I, I go on social media. Okay, great. When's the last time you saw on social media people talking about hell and heaven. Most of the time you don't. This is three ways to make a milkshake, five ways to, I mean, it's, it, this is what people want. This is 10 ways you can invest your, your secondary income. Uh, those things have nothing wrong, friends. I think you and I know those are not issues. Those are good things in its place. But those things are paraded as the BN and N all of life. When friends, the end of life and the start of life is Jesus. And you and I need to know Jesus and our friends and family need to know Jesus. Notice it says, if anyone's name is not found in the book of life, they are going to be thrown into hell. You say, Pastor, how does a person have their name written in the book, Lambs of Life? They have to place their faith in Jesus. That's it. They have to put their hopes, their trust, their life in God's hands through His Son, Jesus Christ, not God in general, many religions, but specifically through the person work, the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's how one is written into the book's lamb of life. Now, none of us have the authority to go and take an eternal pen and change what's on that book. How I wish we could, right? We'll go there and write some of our friends' names and our family's names and our grandpa, grandma's names. But we can't. We can't change what's on the book, but we can start by helping people change their minds towards Christ. We can't forcibly push a person to be written into the life, the book of life, but we can begin that journey with them and sharing with them why Jesus is the only hope, man. Life, love, joy, mercy. Jesus is, is the one, is the one you're looking for. And of course, there's going to be some opposition because it's not going to be easy to evangelize. Of course, people are going to push back. Totally understandable. That happened in all the Bible books. If you read, you see the pushback. You see the apostles preaching. You see people deny. You see people uh, obfuscate. You see people truncate the message. You see people minimize the truth and all that. But even in the sea of opposition, there will always be some that the Lord is preparing for salvation. This is what I'm doing as well. When I'm preaching to all of us, those of us that are here, we call ourselves Christians, awesome, but there's a lot of people that are watching on the internet that are not. 
And I know that this message is going forth to the uh, non-believers as well because I have some of you that text me to say, Pastor, I'm sending this to my unbelieving friends. Please do. Please do. Send it to them. You might be surprised that when they suddenly hear, whoa, hell is real? Hell is real? Huh? I'm going there? They might get angry. They might be confused. But guess what, friends? Conviction might come. Because anger and confusion can find a place of hope in Jesus. You can be angry with God, but finally, if you come to hope in Christ, you are, you are, you are okay. You know what's the worst thing, I think? For people to die and go to hell without realizing there was a hell. For people to die without hope, not knowing there was such a thing as the hope of salvation in Jesus Christ. And you and I, friends, have this wonderful opportunity to begin that process sharing. Let's get to the next one. The worm never dies. This was a weird one when I was researching, but I've seen it many times in the Bible. Mark 9, 48, it says, In hell, the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, the worm does not die can be referring to, you know, when a person dies, there's maggots after a while. When the body decomposes, there's all these worms that come forth. So it could be a picture of that eternal death where the worm never dies. It's an eternal thing. The, the body, or I should say, the spirit is constantly in a state of rotting. People in hell, friends, are not enjoying life. They are suffering in every way imaginable. There's one suffering that I didn't write down here, but I could imagine from an outer darkness perspective is loneliness. How many of us here on earth have experienced loneliness before? You could be in a crowded room. You could be in a place where a lot of your family and friends are there, but maybe you were in a season where you felt all alone. You know what, friends? This is what I found. Even in that place on earth when you feel all alone, when you cry it out, you feel better. Right? When you hopefully talk to a a, a close confidant, you feel better. When you, perhaps you, you get a hug or someone says something to encourage you and comfort you, you feel better. Like here on earth, you can't be fully alone and lonely. But in hell, you suffer alone. Yes, you might have millions and millions of people there suffering, their souls suffering, their spirits suffering, but ultimately you are suffering there alone You don't have company to say, we're all suffering together. Let's all try to bear this through. No, the problem is hell is a lonely place. Greater loneliness than ever before. You say, why? The presence of God is not there. You know, here on earth, God gives us friends. Even if some of our friends are rotten, He gave us friends. But in hell, there's no friends. Everyone is burning. You you, you have no appetite for anything. You are dying. Think about what the Bible has described so far. Worms never die. You're constantly tormented by your past sins. Eternal destruction is on you. It's a lake of fire, so you're burning up. It's outer darkness, so you can't see anything. There's loneliness. Now, let's put a simple point here on earth, okay? If right now, I'm suffering very badly, maybe a very bad stomach ulcer, let's say, even if food comes, I'm not interested. When... You suffer here on earth in a very painful way. You have no interest for sex, for food. For, you just want relief from your pain. And then when relief comes, you, your body begins to recover here on earth and then appetite begins to come back. Your desire for nice things come. I thought about it. In hell, you can't even properly desire for nice things because every single moment, it's torment and pain and destruction. Oh my. It gives me no pleasure saying that. But it has given me some sleepless nights thinking of it. As as not a pastor, just as Pesat Tan, I am like, so what is hell really about? Father, I see your descriptions in the Bible, but you know, descriptions are not the same. You have friends telling you they suffered, right? They so much pain, but you don't understand the pain unless you experience it. So what I read on the page about the truth of hell is still not something I can comprehend. The last one here, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Write this down. Weeping and 
gnashing of teeth or teeth gnashing. Matthew 13, 42. This is what it says. And throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You say, Pastor, why is there weeping and gnashing of teeth? I think we can all venture a good guess. Weeping is not simply crying or tearing. Weeping is loud wailing. Instead of weeping at the death of a loved one at a funeral, now you're weeping for yourself because you are eternally dying. So weeping is that wailing. It's you're in pain. Gnashing of teeth means like you're clenching your teeth. You know, sometimes you clench your teeth until you feel the... You feel like it's clenching of teeth. But some scholars and commentators have said that the gnashing of teeth also refers to anger towards God. That eternal anger uh, and, 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 and hatred towards God. So on one hand, People in hell are weeping because they are wailing at the pain they are receiving. On the other hand, there's this anger. And you say, why is that so? Because they know who put them in hell. And even if sinners in hell know they deserve hell, you must remember that their sins were not paid for. So even in the next life, they are not holy, by the way. They are not pure, by the way. Only those in heaven have been purified. Do you understand? Only those in heaven, we're no longer liars in heaven. We're no longer perverts in heaven. We're no longer thieves in heaven. We're no longer profaners in heaven. We're no longer blasphemers in heaven. We're no longer ignorant. We're no longer gossipers or slanderers in heaven. You understand? We're no longer any form of negativity or sinfulness in heaven. In heaven, we are blameless and blemishless and completely made holy. Here on earth, we still wrestle with flesh. There in heaven, we have no flesh to wrestle with. We are spirit. But in hell, why do people go to hell? They did not repent of their sin and turn to Jesus. So in hell, that still remains the same. They have no faith in Jesus and they are still rotten at the core of their being. They are sinful and that's why they are angry with God for all eternity. I, 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 let's, not even talk about, let's not even talk about the pain of hell for a minute. But as a Christian, Imagine someone being angry with God for all eternity. How horrible that is. Friend, those of you that are watching online, you say, Pastor, I'm angry with God. Friend, I, I want you to know God can handle your anger now while you're here on earth. You can turn your anger to this God and say, God, I'm angry with you. How dare you make a hell? God, how dare you let me be a, you know, born into this world? Whatever it is, you can be angry with God now here on earth, but pursue that train of thought to find out who this God is. And finally, you might come to this person called Jesus, whom the Lord sent for your soul to save you. The world is angry with God, and yet God still sent a Savior. Think about that. The world is so angry but still God sent a saviour. And you saw the anger of men on Jesus, did you not? You say, when did we see the anger of men on Jesus? Do you not see his whippings? Do you not hear the crown of thorns on his brow? Do you not see that they spat at him and they beat him and they punched him? Do you not see that they dragged him into the outer courts? Did you not see them take Jesus and put him on the cross? That is the anger and vileness of man towards God, if that's what man wants to do towards God, and yet God allowed it for the sake of saving men. Do you see the, the brilliance, but at the same time, the unimaginable situation? The means of our salvation is that the Son of God has to be butchered for us at the hands of of sinful men. Take Jesus today, the one we killed, or when we die, we will be killed for all eternity. We will be destroyed again and again and again and again, and we deserve it, even though we don't like it. Now, friends, we all know this. There are things we don't like, but we deserve. Oh, pastor, I didn't take care of my health. Now I'm suffering from X, Y, Z. Brother, sister, we empathize, but do you deserve it? Yes, I know, pastor, I deserve it, but I don't like it. There are things we deserve, but we don't like. 
Hell is a place that people deserve, but they don't like. No one likes hell. Oh, pastor, I gambled away my house. I gambled away all my money. You deserve it, but you don't like it. I'm not telling you to like hell, friend. I hate hell. I don't like thinking about hell. But I know it's real. And I know that hell is coming. And I know that judgment is coming. And I know that we're going to meet God before we know it. And I know that our family and friends are going to meet God before they know it. Just a few days ago, we read the news. The Prime Minister of Japan killed. Just like that. Snuffed out another life. Gone. You know, there's this statistic. You say, Pastor, how many souls die in a day? I, 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 why don't I tell you something even worse? Don't even talk about a day. Every single second, three people die. So for the length of this sermon, hundreds have died. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 15 people just perish like that somewhere around the globe. Going to heaven or, or hell. Throw them into the fiery furnace in that place they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Okay, let's get to some good news, shall we? How should we respond? I don't want to leave you this way. You say, Pastor, later after this, I can't eat, no. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm not trying to freak you out. My intent is not to make you gag or vomit. My intent is not to put fear of hell in the hearts of believers. That's not it. I'm just giving you what the Bible says. And again, the descriptions are not even as bad as the real thing. You, you get my point? The descriptions are still not as bad as the real thing. Because pain is always worse, not on the page, but in the reality. How should we respond? The only way, friend, by entering through the narrow door. He said, Pastor, when I went into the church today, the door not that small. It's nothing to do with how big your door is or how big the door of the church is. It's a question of seeing who Christ is. Again, that singular one way. Pastor, my friends think I'm narrow-minded. Good, you're walking through the narrow door. It's fine, all right? Narrow is okay when it comes to true salvation. You're walking through the narrow gate, the narrow door. His name is Jesus. I want you to see a passage before we close. Very important passage. Jesus is speaking and engaging with people on the issues of eternity, heaven, and hell. But you've got to hear this. Luke 13, starting from verse 23. Important you hear this. Look on screen, please, everyone. Please. Jesus is going to address this question. Someone said to Jesus, Lord, will those who are saved be few? So this person is saying, um, Jesus, how many people are going to heaven? Are there going to be a lot of or, or a few? Jesus replied, verse 24, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. I am not someone that looked at this verse casually in the last 10 years of my Christian walk. That oftentimes I saw this verse, it just, it just puts a sense of fresh conviction. And I've investigated this verse for a long time. Can I just share with you a few thoughts? Very quick, because this verse is huge. Verse 24, this is so big. Underline your Bibles three, four times. Notice Jesus didn't say, do not strive to enter through. Now, again, this is the confusion Christians have. But pastor, we can't save ourselves. You can't save yourself, obviously. But Jesus is basically saying, look, many people are not even thinking about eternity. So it's not even something they're thinking about. They're striving for everything else except heaven. They're not thinking about life and death. So he actually gives an instruction. Notice he didn't say don't strive. He said strive to enter through the narrow door. Now, this is not the same as saving yourself, but he's explaining to you and I, you actually have to think about eternity. Jesus says strive to enter through the narrow door and he explains, he said many will try and still 
not be able to enter. You say, why? Because the door is very narrow. And I love some of the biblical preachers of the 1600s that explain it this way. The door is so narrow and many people are saying, can I enter through heaven with this sin and that baggage and that conscious issue and, and all these things of the past, all this filth of the past. Can I enter through the narrow door hanging on to my sin? The answer is no. That's why we have to repent, which means turn our hearts, turn our minds, metanoia, turn away from those things of the past. And did Lord's wife enter through the narrow door? No! God gave a way of escape. The angel came. You can leave Sodom and Gomorrah. And she ran out, but she still loved Sodom and Gomorrah. So she looked back. Judgment came. She died. She's in hell. There's no evidence that Lot's wife is a believer at all. None. Bible is clear. Lot was righteous. Lot's wife was not. The New Testament warns us, remember Lot's wife. She wanted to go to heaven bringing Sodom and Gomorrah. You cannot. you got to leave Sodom and Gomorrah behind. You cannot fit through the narrow door with your sins and your baggage and your past hurts. You cannot. You cannot enter heaven with unforgiveness. you got to leave it down and say, God, help me. Many people are going to strive to enter through the narrow door, but the door they're going to find is just too narrow because their baggage is just too large. I know some of you are so hurt. Pastor, I've been hurt. Pastor, I know these are the, the, the common emails I receive from you is you have been hurt. I know, friend, he, take it from me. I've been hurt. Badly. But still, Jesus' call to me is the same as the call to you. Forgive those who have wronged you as the Father has also forgiven you. Forgiveness is one of the things I believe that many church folk are still trying to hold on to and still trying to enter through heaven. And you're going to find if you're holding on to unforgiveness, Jesus says, forgive that the Father shall forgive you. If you do not forgive, he says to the believer, the Heavenly Father will not forgive you. On that day, we carry our unforgiveness and we're saying, we're going to receive well done. And as we're trying to squeeze into the narrow door, and let's say we see Pastor Samson walking through and they say, Pastor Samson, hold it, hold it, Pastor Samson, come help me. Help me, help me squeeze this through, okay? Pastor Sam can't even help you. He can't hold on. If he holds to your unforgiveness, he can't enter in. You can't bring your baggage to heaven. You gotta lay it down. Pastor, the hurts were so bad. I tell you what's worse, hell. Hell is far worse. It might hurt you now to forgive, but it's going to bring a, a beautiful, bountiful fruitfulness of healing and righteousness. Forgive. Let go of that baggage, friend. Pastor, are you speaking to the non-Christian or me? Anyone. If you are an unbeliever, unforgiveness might be the reason why you go to hell. If you are a professing Christian, unforgiveness might also be the reason why you're not going to heaven. Forgive, Lord, help me. I'm so hurt. Show me the cross. I've been hurt by someone, but I've hurt Jesus, and that's why he went to the cross. Lord, help me see your cross, your blood. Help me see that it hurt you to forgive me, and likewise, it hurts me now to forgive, but I will release that baggage and that bondage now. Why? I want to go through the narrow gate. I want to walk through the narrow door. On that day, I want to be able to walk through and realize, wow, I made it by the name of Christ. I made it through the blood of the Lamb. I made it because Jesus is truly the one. And friends, guess who was the one that said, if you do not forgive, my Heavenly Father will not forgive you. It wasn't Pastor Pacer. It was Jesus. Jesus said it. Because the narrow door doesn't allow for anything more than you to go through. But you cannot hold in anything else. Let's finish up 25. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door. That is judgment, right? It's very frightening what it says here, but please bear with this. And you begin to stand outside to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us. Then he will answer you. I do not know where you come from. Verse 26, then you will begin to say, 
We ate and drank in your presence, God, and you taught in our streets. But he will say to you, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. You say, why evil? Again, the narrow door cannot allow any sin to go through. We don't use sin as the word evil, but you must understand how God views sin. It's far more heinous and evil than we view sin. We think our lives are small, but our lives condemn Jesus at the cross. Our lies, even the white lies, the gray lies, condemn Jesus at the cross. One lie is enough for us to be in hell for all eternity. Do you get it? But we don't see how deep and, and villainous our sin is because we are still sinful in our flesh. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdoms of God, but you yourself cast out. Friend, let's not be cast out. Let's be brought in by the grace and the mercy of Jesus. Finish up. 29. People from east and west and from the north and south will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first and some who are first will be last. How do I close it? Look at the last verse. Remember that story, the rich man? on earth was first and the beggar was last on earth died reverse rich man now is last the beggar is first now again it's not about money but it's to show you that what happens on earth is not the end point success on earth is not the end point it's whether we are successful in the next life whether we are living for the Lord Jesus Christ and you know what, friends? Today is a day we commit ourselves to God. Now, I don't want you to fear hell in a wrong way. Hell is not meant for the saints. Hell is not meant for those that say, I'm going to place my faith on the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm going to walk with Him. I really am going to walk with Him. I'm going to endeavor to follow and obey Jesus. And even if I slip, I want to turn from sin again and I want to turn to Christ. So you have no fear, friend. If that's you, you have no fear. Here's the consent, though. If you say, Pastor, then I'm a Christian, am I okay? Look, look, look. If you are a half-hearted Christian, you should be concerned. I'm not saying you should fear, you should be concerned. If you're a Christian that is always thinking of living by the world and at the same time trying to live for Christ, you should be concerned because you're holding too much baggage right now. If you have unforgiveness, hatred, if you still see sin sticking as a sore thumb in your life or my life, we should be concerned. Concerned enough to say, God, I need help. And I'm going to seek your face. Last thing can I share with you that's interesting. The Bible says, when a master of the house stands up and closes the door, and then those that do not enter in, right? Because the door is closed, a narrow door. Enter through the narrow door. Right? But when he closes the door, means that's game over. No one can enter in. Now listen closely to what Jesus says elsewhere. He says what? Well, there's time where he says what? Ask and it shall be given to us. Seek, and you shall find. Knock! Listen, listen. And the door shall be opened to you. We use this ask, seek, and knock many times solely for worldly gains. Let's be honest. I'm asking for a wife. I'm seeking for a good job. I'm knocking for golden opportunities. Now, again, those are not wrong in itself, but I want you to go further than those very simplistic Low-level prayers. Can you see now? Ask and it shall be given unto you. Lord, I'm asking for a changed life. Seek and you shall find. Lord, I want to seek the real treasure of heaven. Now, I, 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 I'm, I'm okay. I, I finance, I have health. But I, I want to seek for higher truth, higher light. I want to seek to live out a life that really pleases you. Knock and the door shall be open. Listen, listen. Many of us are praying for opportunities to open to enrich us. Can some of us now begin to knock on the door and say, God, help me to seek out opportunities to bless others. And you know what? You'll be glad you did it. If in this life, you ask and the door shall be open. You seek and you knock on that door according to spiritual, wonderful things that Jesus wants to give us so that we can be a blessing. On that day, when we see the narrow door, we look around us, we say, wow, praise God. I gave, I loved, 
Praise God. I receive the blessings of Jesus. Praise God. I put my faith on Christ. Praise God. I gave up my unforgiveness. I gave up my former sin. I gave up my lust. I gave up my swearing. I gave up my gambling. I gave up my... I gave it up. I gave it up. I gave it up. I gave up all those things. I gave it up. I gave it up. I'm able to walk through the narrow door and you'll walk through. And the Bible says, good news, right? As far as from the north, south, and east, west, those of us that walk through the narrow door, we will recline at the table with Jesus. Same picture as when Jesus was at the Last Supper, he reclined at the table. So we'll be there at the table of the Lord, the Lord's mercy. Come to the table of the Lord. What happens at the table, Pastor? Eating, feasting, fellowshipping, drinking the wine of His mercy, eating the meat of His righteousness, enjoying the fellowship with Father, Son, and Holy Ghost and other, other saints who are in heaven. Can I give you one last thing? We still have just a bit of time. I don't know how this sermon is going to impact you. I do not know. I know that I'm supposed to give it. May the Word of God go forth and produce what it needs to go forth. For some of you that say, Pastor, as I'm hearing this sermon, I'm really angry right now. Can I, can I give you a very loving uh, outlet for it? Can you write to me and tell me you're angry? It's okay. You can even say, Pastor, I'm angry with you. I'm okay. I can handle it. I can handle it. Okay? And then I want to interact with you and say, to care for your soul. Friend, do you know that you can't go to heaven if you keep your anger? Do you know that? Your anger could be the very reason why you are not going to make it through the narrow door. Give it up. Give it up. Give up those things. We want to walk through the narrow door. We want to be spiritually slim, but spiritually strong. Walking through the narrow door. Unforgiveness is a big one. Give it up today. For some of you that said, Pastor, I'm really ready for heaven. Praise God. Can you take the next step, please? Can you get others ready? I don't know who I'm speaking with. Some of you are really spiritually mature. Can you get other people ready? Time is so short. Before you know it, people around you are going to not be here. Time is really very short. Get going. Get going. It's an urgency now. Get going. Share the gospel with them. Tell them Jesus is the only way. Tell them Jesus is the only way. No one else. No one else. Tell them there's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. There's a Christ to be received. At the end of this journey, receive the price of your salvation, Jesus himself. With that, would you stand with me? Tampanis Woodlands, would you stand? And again, I stress to you, brothers, sisters, if some of you say, Pastor, I, I want to engage with you further, just write to me, okay? Pesatan at lighthouse.org.sg. Rewind this video to find out. Pesatan at lighthouse.org.sg. Or those of you that already have me on social media, write me a text, send me a text, let me engage with you, okay? But don't stay angry for too long. Beat your hands towards the door of heaven. Ask, seek, and knock. Two prayers now to pray. The first prayer is for all of us to enter through the narrow door. I think we all want to pray that. I want to pray that for you and I want to pray that for myself. And the second prayer would be, we want to lead others through the narrow door. Would you bow with me, please? Father, I don't know who this is for, but I know I personally want to enter through the narrow door. I don't want to be cast to hell. Lord, I know this might surprise some of us because we all assume that, hey, we're all in church. Shouldn't we be okay? But your word is so clear in many places that it's not enough to profess faith. We need to live it out. It's not enough to look like a Judas who seemed like a real disciple, but he was not. And Father, I want to be a real deal. I want to be a follower of Jesus. Help me. Would you help my brothers and sisters as well? We want to enter through the narrow door. And some of us, the baggage right now is unforgiveness. In Jesus' name, unforgiveness is gone. We're going to lay it down. Lord, help us to forgive our enemies, to love them, to pray for those who persecute us and come against us. Lord, we look at our enemies and we are very worried and sometimes hurt by what they did. Our Father, we know this doesn't please you. Help us to lay it down. Father, some of us, it's other sins. Lord, whatever the sin might be, we want to lay it down now. Lord, can you give us a strength? Addictions has to go in Jesus' name. It's gone, it's gone, it's gone. Help us, Lord, to leave regrets down. Help us to leave anger down. Anything that is not befitting of the cross, help us to leave it down, Lord, on that day when we see you. We want to be able to walk through the narrow door, Lord. Secure our heart. Show us your love, oh God. Lord, for some of us, I think this is the real issue. We have not encountered the love of God for so long. Brother, sister, please hear this. Even in the midst of the conversation of hell, please know Jesus is love 
and God loves you and He has laid His Son down at the cross to show you His love. Lord, help us to receive Your love now in Jesus' name. And all of us say Amen. Now look at me, second prayer, okay? Can you please think of at least one or two persons that you know are not Christians, okay? In your family, close friends of yours. Can you pray alongside, please? Now, these are your friends. These are not my friends, okay? But I have people I want to pray for as well. So as we pray this together, focus on who you want to share the gospel with. Let's pray. Would you bow your heads, please? Father, there are people we know that are outside your kingdom at the moment. And if that should continue on the day of their death, then all the horrendous descriptions on what hell is like would befall on all these people. Lord, these are precious to us. These are people we know that love us. I recall even in this midst, we have a brother here that has been praying for his unbelieving wife for 10 over years, 15 over years, 20 years. And brother, you told me how painful it was that your wife is still not in faith. Lord, help us, Lord, to have a conviction. We want to share with family and friends. And there's a person in our mind right now. There's a second person in our mind right now. God, help us, Lord. Even after this service, we want to do something. We want to share with them the love of Christ somehow. Maybe even share this sermon, share other wonderful sermons around the internet to bless their soul. Share with them that Jesus really is the, the Savior of the world. Lord, would you right now even put a fresh conviction in us, an evangelistic zeal, a zeal because we want our friends and family to shun this wicked, horrendous place called hell and to be found in the loving arms of God in heaven. Lord, help us. Lord, give me, give us such a deep compassion, such a deep unction in Jesus' name. And all of us say amen. Now, we still have a bit of time. We're going to sing and then Pastor Sam will close us up. But listen to one final thing, okay? We have three more weeks on hell and I know you're saying, Pastor, that's so much. I know, I know. But I think five weeks will seal the deal, okay? I hope after five weeks we hear about hell, we would be saying, no way. No, 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 no. No hell for my family, amen. Can someone believe that? No hell for my family, no, 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 no. And we're going to believe that God is going to save our sons, our daughters, our, our grandchildren. God is going to save, okay? You know, I, I, have a, I have a brother that recently told me that his son has abandoned the faith. I don't know how to respond, okay? God is going to save our children. And God is going to save our children's children. All right? And so as we sing this song, can you just stretch out your hands? Let's worship the Lord. Let's trust that the Lord is going to bring real salvation in our midst. Amen, amen. God bless you, church.